Hello and welcome to the latest Insider interview. Our guest today is Doug Leddingham, manager of the ACE40 Sustainable Recommended Fund Pacific Assets Investment Trust. Doug, thank you very much for coming into the studio. Thank you for having me. About half the portfolio is invested in India and only about 10% in China, so it's very different yeah. to the benchmark. Can you talk me through that investment decision? So it's entirely driven bottom up by where we see the best opportunities for long-term capital growth. In India, we're spoilt for choice when it comes to world-class family owners running interesting franchises and are well positioned for structural growth. One example of our favorite companies in India at the moment is a company called Mahindra Mahindra. It's been around since the 1940s. It's family owned and has a professional CEO. So it's got that combination of long-term steward with highly competent professional management that we seek in our companies. It's been a great performer for the company to date on account of growing evidence of both its restructuring and knockout sales from its tractor franchise, as well as the re release of its new line of electric vehicles. Mahindra Mahindra is also a great example of where we've engaged with the company. We've held the company for close to 10 years. But in the last few years, we struggled slightly with some of the capital allocation decisions that would, had been going on at the company. So we had multiple conversations with the board and the family members about how Mahindra Mahindra could improve its capital allocation. And in 2020, we saw a new CEO be appointed. And since that appointment, the CEO has come in, he's closed loss-making businesses, he's sold a terrible Korean auto um, investment that they had, and has since set the company on a better trajectory towards profitability, while, as I mentioned, releasing a, a new line of electric vehicles and continuing to invest in their dominant um, tractor franchise. When it comes to China, we've long struggled to build an extensive list of investable companies in China because of their inability to meet our quality threshold. We've never owned the Chinese internet companies because we struggled with the quality of people. We've struggled with the corporate structures that meant that minority shareholders didn't actually own the underlying business. We struggled with the financials and we struggled to understand how these companies were aligned with the Chinese Communist Party longer term as it became increasingly dominant through all, in all parts of the economy. In China, where we can find opportunities are in companies that operate as far away from the state as possible. So we don't own any SOEs. We don't own companies that operate in politically sensitive sectors. Instead, we own companies that are run by private entrepreneurs who have built quality franchises on the back of R&D and who are well positioned to benefit from the tailwinds that the Chinese Communist Party is looking to deliver. So whether that be the creation of a low cost, high quality healthcare system, so we own a diagnostics company, for example, or the supply of industrial automation that will increase productivity, or a company such as Vitasoy, which is a Hong Kong listed manufacturer of plant-based beverages and is the leading, holds a leading market share in China. And in our view, should be well positioned to benefit again as the Chinese middle class looks to consume a healthier diet. But again, as bottom-up active investors, we really have the freedom and flexibility to see, to allocate the trust capital where we believe the best opportunities are, no matter what the benchmark looks like. China has a huge population, this emerging middle class, everyone's very well educated. So aren't you missing out on an amazing opportunity to profit from that trend? Or do you have companies listed in other markets which actually operate in China, so you get the best of, of both worlds? Yes, yeah, so certainly that's one way we've looked to approach investing in China over the last 10 years, is finding companies listed outside of China where we have the ability to gain comfort in the quality of the people and the quality of the franchise. And whether that be companies in Japan, such as uh, Hoya, which is a leading manufacturer of semiconductor equipment, as well as the second largest manufacturer for lenses and eyeglasses. And China has an epidem epidemic when it comes to um, myopia and short-sightedness. So we believe that Hoya is perfectly well positioned to enjoy not only structural growth and its profits, but also solve a major societal issue in China. Um, similarly, a number of our Taiwanese companies have exposure to China. Um, a company such as um, Voltronic, which is the leading manufacturer 
of uninterruptible power supplies. Now, these are the devices that kick in when mains electricity fails and continue, can provide backup power to vital equipment in um, hospitals, data centers, or in industrial settings. It's also a leading manufacturer of solar inverters. Now, Voltronic is a global company and has exposure to great structural growth opportunities while also being able to gain growth within the Chinese market. So it's, it's, it's the kind of company that we're looking for. There's a, there's a great passionate long-term founder at the helm. It has world-class technology, a highly respected reputation and exposure to very attractive structural growth markets with some exposure to China. So I think with Voltronic, we have the ability to own the company for the next 10 years without too much concern about what happens at the macroeconomic level. So you own Taiwanese stocks and Chinese stocks. This is obviously an area of, of tension globally mm -hmm. at the moment. So what's your understanding about what may happen and how do you go about picking companies which might be okay if there is a, a conflict mm -hmm. or do you just avoid the idea of well, a conflict ever happening at all? That's going to be a very boring answer. But again, we, we appreciate the growing tension and com um, that's going on between the two countries, but we don't believe that we have the ability to guess what will happen and when will happen, and especially not the ability to build a portfolio around how stock prices will react to that kind of news. So we try to keep our head down and, and focus bottom up on, on owning those companies like Voltronic or companies like Vitasoy or Hoya that have resilient franchises that are delighting their customers every day where there's a large unmet need for the products they're supplying and who have balance sheets that should survive macroeconomic turmoil. And people at the helm who can take a long-term view and again, invest today for building a better company tomorrow, which gets us excited. And it's in our eyes far better to get excited about those resilient long-term companies rather than spending too much time reading the news or trying to speculate on what could happen to the portfolio on a top-down basis. India is the biggest position in the portfolio. It's also been one of the best performing markets globally this year. Mm -hmm. So are there signs of exuberance in India? And how expensive are shares there? Are you now paying a premium to own Indian stocks? So I'd, I'd say that India certainly hasn't been immune to the euphoria that's engulfed global markets over the last few years. It had its fair share of you know, blockbuster technology, IPOs, greater retail participation in markets, and headlines, again, similar to here, full of high-flying technology companies with unproven business models. More recently, we've seen a slowdown in IPOs. Those major IPOs are now trading below their initial um, trading date. And we've seen significant foreign selling of Indian equities. From a valuation perspective, if we take HDFC, which is one of the trust's largest positions, it's the leading mortgage provider in India, and it's trading at valuations close to all-time lows, and its mortgage book is valued at levels similar to its European or US contemporaries, despite quality that's far superior and the ability to benefit from growing mortgage penetration. So mortgage penetration as a percentage of GDP in India is less than 10% versus the 65 or 70% that we see in much of the developed Europe, European markets. And again, similarly, uh, Mahindra Mahindra, the company we've, we've touched on, a leading franchise in India with exposure to a number of growing structural tailwinds. It's valued on less than 20 times PE. So these aren't valuations that we believe reflect the euphoric market. What I would say is that more recently there's been a greater appreciation of the opportunities for some of the country's high quality industrial companies to generate attractive growth should we see a revival of the Indian infrastructure and manufacturing cycle. So you're looking for quality companies, often that comes with a high price tag. Are there examples where you perhaps sold out of companies that you really like because they've become too expensive or invested in maybe perhaps lower quality companies that are now very cheap? So what have been the most recent you know, trades that you've been up to? So the, the, the average long-term turnover of the trust is between 10 and 15%. So we don't tend to do very much and move quite slowly. Um, some of the recent activity in the portfolio has been to take some money out of our very strong performing Indian companies. And 
despite our belief that they continue to offer a long-term growth. The position sizes had reached domi um, very dominant positions in the portfolio, so we've chosen to take some um, money out of those, which we never like doing, but we believe in having a relatively diversified portfolio and we don't want too much exposure to a particular trend. Where we have been adding recently um, is to some of our favorite smaller Southeast Asian names. Um, one example would be a company called Humanica, which is the leading provider of HR software in Southeast Asia. Now, HR software in Southeast Asia um, is a long way behind what we see in the US or Europe, but we're very excited about Humanica given its fantastic stewardship, its world-class technology, its uh, very attractive cash flow generation, that over the next 10, 20 years, that Humanica should be a key beneficiary of that gap in HR penetration closing between Southeast Asia and the US. And with a market cap of only 200 million, a large opportunity ahead of its minimal local competition, we're very excited about the opportunity it has to deliver long-term returns to the, to the investment trust. You don't own any resource stocks in the portfolio. Has that cost you this year with the rising oil price and, and other commodity prices? And why don't you invest in that part of the market? So we don't really think about relative returns or things that we don't own. Uh, and so we don't own resource companies because they tend to fail our want to own quality companies uh, well positioned for sustainable development. Uh, resource companies tend to be highly cyclical. They lack pricing power. And the vast majority of these companies tend to have portfolios that aren't well positioned for sustainable development. Now, there are a couple of companies in Asia that have portfolios with interesting commodities like nickel um, or copper. But the corporate governance at these companies makes it very easy for us to say no thank you and move on very quickly. Have you been doing much traveling to Asia recently? Obviously, there's been a lot happening and travel has been um, quite restricted. Mm -hmm. So have you been getting out there to meet companies face to face? So the last three years has been a very frustrating time for us. It's, it's involved lots of early mornings talking to um, Asian management teams in front of a computer screen. And travel and spending time with people is an important part of our process. We attribute a lot to the quality of people behind a business and especially the culture in which they're looking to build. So being able to travel and spend time with people and spend time with employees is an important part of our process. And being able to sit across from uh, an executive who's passionately looking to solve some of Asia's leading problems is one of the most exciting parts of the job. Thankfully, over the last couple of months, we have been able to get back on the road. Um, so some of my colleagues have been able to spend a week in India and I'm just back from uh, a week in Japan. So it's, it's great fun being back on the road and we've got lots of um, trips lined up in the pipeline. Pacific Assets Investment Trust has a sustainability mandate. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about what that means and how it impacts how you pick stocks? So yes, at Stuart Investors, we are long-term investors. And in our view, being a long-term investor naturally means you have to think about how a company is positioned relative to the multiple um, sustainable development headwinds and tailwinds. So we're looking to own companies that are both high quality and well positioned for sustainable development, as we believe that they have the ability to deliver above average returns for our clients. And as part of that sustainability focus, engagement is a core part of what we do every day. Every member of the team is an analyst and every member of the team is engaging um, to improve the quality of our companies. We believe that none of our companies are perfect. So engagement is a core part of what we're doing to help both improve returns and reduce risk. So we'll be talking to management teams from a variety of perspectives, whether it be the, their supply chain, their, the quality of their product portfolio from a sugar or, or fat perspective, the recyclability of their products, their exposure to oil and gas. And this for us is not only an, an important part of what we do in terms of improving companies, but it's also an important um, part of the job in terms of understanding the quality of the people behind businesses, the longer the time horizon of the management team, we believe the better they have an ability to understand the need for companies to improve. And thus, we believe we have a far greater chance of engaging and successfully engaging with companies that have a long term time horizon. And finally, the question we ask all of our guests, do you personally invest in the trust? Yes, I do. And just as importantly, so do much of my family and friends. Doug, thanks for coming to the studio. Thank you very much for having me.
And that's all we've got time for today. You can check out more insider interviews on our YouTube channel, where you can like, comment, and subscribe. See you next time.